This is the complete brawl guide, an over 5,000 word script, condensed ideas from some of the best pro Overwatch coaches in the scene, and I go through multiple different cop matchups with Overwatch League and Flash Up analysis. But you want to know the best part? It's easy for you, regardless of your rank, to understand this video. To begin, I'm going to split this video into four clear, easy to follow sections, including specific detail on each hero, but also looking more holistically of how the comp functions, with different variations into different comps onto different maps. I hope you enjoy and please share this around. Starting off with Tank, we'll use Reinhardt as the foundation. Brawl Micro, like shield management, fire striking corners, tracking the enemy shatter, counterpinning, etc. are obvious staples but shield management in particular is probably the most important one. Please do not waste shield early or use it while standing still. Most of the time you're going to use it to take space or to retreat back, and maybe interweaving your swings to minimise damage taken. In mirrors, so when you're playing against another brawl comp, target priority becomes the main thing, aka swinging and fire striking onto the enemy Mei and not just the enemy Reinhardt. Also, utilise cart for good shatters. I rewatched the entirety of London's play and run, and this was actually pulled out by Hardy, utilizing point in some kind of cheeky way to, well, get a cheeky shatter. This works because the point blocks LOS onto Hardy, meaning it's a lot harder to read and predict what he's gonna do. In terms of your role, it's pretty self explanatory. Swing and walk onto walled targets, or back the fuck up and stabilize if you are the walled target. A lot of good Rhinot play comes down to knowing your macro and matchups, so I recommend skipping to those sections. Now into Mei. You'll see most Brawl teams play with a Mei, and that's just because of the wall. Wall is one of the most important cooldowns in your comp, and I go over the many uses in my Mei guides. But just for now, you'll mainly see Mei wall used to get traditional splits and to push some kind of advantage, or you'll see it being used to block LOS from range threats like Arna's nade for example. Here's two bits of important micro though. Firstly, you need to be utilising some kind of cover to not get your ice block forced out early, especially in the mirror. If you're swinging or pushing an open space, you better at least be doing it with a shield. For example, in the flash up grand final, Sugar Free's positioning is very questionable. For starters, he's ahead of his Sigma, meaning he can't even get shield to hold space, and he's also using a slither of cover, meaning his crow gets forced out early, and he just dies. This is the peak of NA by the way. Secondly, try and get walls that are flush with the map geometry to deny areas of cover. Credit to contenders coach Sage for this idea. For example, here in Flash Ops, Sam is hard playing the cover to the right side of Hawk, but Sugar Free walls behind Sam, eliminating that cover entirely and forcing out an early cryo. Unfortunately, Timeless still loses this fight because Sam just hits a crazy right click, but the point still stands. Also, while I'm at it, a little bit of micro here. Hawk should be rocking the Mei here after she gets walled, as the normal combo in the Sigma Brawl is wall, rock, and then amp speed in, and honestly, that probably would have killed Sam here. Bit unfortunate that he rocks the Ramatra. The complementary or even alternative flex DPS to Mei is Symmetra. I can't make this video without talking about her. The real value is primarily from the TP, and as you'll see with the many visual examples in the matchup and macro section, there are so many uses of TP. As a summary, you can use it to skip rotations or big sets of open space, set up crossfires, gain or clear high grounds, set up surprise windows or angles, rush onto a target or a group, flip the map, and more. Again, there's going to be a ton of visual examples showing this, so be sure to stick around. Obviously, I have to plug my coaching, you can get all of that in the link down below. Now onto the hitscan slot, which is mainly going to be Sojourn, but I'll talk about variations later in that section. And good news, this is really simple. You literally just flank when either team engages with their wall, and I actually wish there was more to it than this, but yeah. Here's an example from Pro Coach Commander X showing a prime example of this. And it's generally that you start with your team, and then once you have that rail, that's your ability to go and make a play. Now Quartz is going to get rail, he's going to manage to get through on the flank unnoticed, charge up the last little bit, and connects onto Landon. Now, the reason this works so well, why Quartz has so much success with this is one, he hits the shot. If you're a hitscan player, hitting the shots always going to help a lot. But also, his timing is perfect here. Because it's just as KSA walks, it means Checkmate gets this wall. They see this timing to walk forward, but that means all the attention is in this area, which allows Quartz to free opportunity. Now into Lucio. 
Thankfully, this is also pretty simple, especially if you've watched my Lucio guide, because the triple R playstyles still apply. As a reminder, the first R is the run it playstyle, meaning you're speeding your team to engage or run it down. You'll be trying to look for boops that make it easier to rush down the target. Like on Esperanza, this boop on Hardy disables his ability to escape, causing his death. The second R is the relieve it playstyle. This is centered around relieving pressure off your team in some way, shape or form. This can be booping enemies away from your team, but also helping your DPS win and fight flanks, which relieves pressure off them. London did this pretty well against Atlanta Reigns Zive comp, where Admiral helped to relieve pressure off Backbone's May. The third R is Reddit. This is a legit playstyle where you draw squishies as the fight becomes devolved. Here's an example from a Grandmaster Ball team that I coached. So if you're gonna Katsune Rush and go fast here, what do we need to do? Maybe I should be over the other side of the wall. Yeah, um, right? Okay. Like, look at this. This is a nice pincer. Like, here, here. Alright, that soldier's dead. And you got speed from Katsune, so you don't need that, and shout too. You also could even help the Genji here, right? And then you can do some Reddit stuff, right? And then have a little bit of fun. The Katsune rush itself is not the problem. The problem is how we approach it and how we set up for it. I think what's gonna happen is they're just gonna ski out, and then they just cheated out your Katsune rush for free. Because there's no follow up, right? There's no setup to this. Yeah, right? So this is as predictable as it could have been. The biggest idea to take away from Lucio is that these playstyles can overlap, and they can also change throughout a fight. It's not like you just pick a one playstyle and that's all you do. I've got quite a few Grandmaster Lucio coaching sessions that explain that, so feel free to check those out on the top right, since I still want this video to be somewhat concise. And lastly, Baptiste. Arguably the simplest role in the comp, but one of the most mechanically demanding. There's not too much specific to the brawl comp for Baptiste, apart from one thing, and that's your window. In Flash Ops, we all saw the classic window rollgun combo, but in the Overwatch League, this was also common with Bastion Nade too. This stuff needs coordination and planning ahead to do. There's also individual windows, where you take a separate angle for yourself, pop your window, and go ham. Again, I haven't got time to show that stuff in more detail, but there'll be links down below. Onto the macro. It changes depending on the matchup, but the very basic and broad theory is that your frontline, aka your tank and your Mei, will be applying frontline pressure with war cycles. At the same time, your other DPS will look to flank and get value, while your Lusu either helps with the frontline trade or on the flank. I'll talk about specific macro and win conditions in each of the comp matchup sections. As for broader macro, the most important bit has to be the push-pull, which I made an entire video dedicated to. I don't want to retread ground that's already been covered, so I'll summarise it here, but Jesus Christ, every coach that I know has always said that Rush or Brawl teams can actually play slow. So please, do not leave this video thinking that Brawl is just a W key comp. In essence, when we have these big ult fights, as said before, you can't just expect to pop a window, press W key, and win the fights. You certainly push when you do use an ultimate, but you have to pull in response to the enemy team's ultimates. And a lot of mistakes can be tracked back using the push-pull framework as you can see on screen, asking yourself whether you really needed to ult, how you could have gotten more value with the ults that you did use, and how to mitigate the value from the enemy team's ults. Generally speaking, if you're at an ultimate advantage, just play the long fights and you'll eventually win because you have more ults. If you're at an ult disadvantage, there's a few more options. You can look to bait or cheat ults from the enemy team early, you can play fast and catch someone off guard with like a cheeky shatter, or you can play slow and build ults throughout the fights as long as you're close to them and you know you're gonna get them in the mid fights. I recommend watching the rest of my advanced concept guides to help build a wider macro understanding of the game. Another very key concept, whenever you're playing any kind of brawl comp into something that's not a mirror, is bunkering. AKA, utilising map geometry to hide your backline in places that reduce the amount of angles onto them and which can create dead zones. Mr X brought this up on Blizzard World, where London rotated in such a position where the space behind them wasn't being used by the enemy team at all, creating a dead zone and making the angles in front of them much easier to absorb and deal with. This also applies to second point too, as well as the yellow point in Suravasa. Some additional examples would be on Ilios Ruins, where you can have your backline bunker near the catwalk to reduce the angles the dive can come from, and creating a dead zone behind you where nobody can come from, because it's literally just a wall. Against Vancouver Titans in the play-ins, Spitfire actually combined this idea with SimTPs, teleporting to and from adjacent sides of the points. 
London would have their Baptiste bunker underneath the windmill or have him bunker by the mini. Here's another bunker example of Midtown Seconds, where because Landon is just in such a turtle position, it makes it way more predictable from when and where the Genji and the Queen are going to dive onto Landon. I'll talk about this more in the dive matchups. On Coliseo Attack, you can bunker underneath the bridge when playing against any form of dive instead of standing out in the open space. I spoke about how my team actually used this open space to set up a kill box and a web with three different angles from high grounds, but by bunkering underneath, you straight up remove one of the angles and you create a dead zone behind you. You can also get creative with Maywalls and Sim TPs as well. On Gibraltar, there's tons of spaces to bunker in, but a slightly unconventional one was seen here against the Shock's dive comp on first point attack, where again, you can see Sparker TP across the open space and then land a bunkers by the mini, where you can only get dough from two possible angles. Again, I'll mention this in the dive section, but you can also see Sparker TP duel and force out the enemy Sombra, as well as Backbone's Great Wall blocking off Renko from getting a clean nade. And lastly, on Antarctic Peninsula, you can see London bunker underneath the high grounds, creating a dead zone behind them. Even though London get constantly naded, because Outlaws are limited in terms of the angles they can take, they're clearly having a tough time getting any secure follow-up. This leads me onto the second major point, which is forcing points, which is what Heidi does here as well. Now, why you force points changes based on what comp you play against. Against mobile comps who often want many angles to stage a dive onto you, forcing point is used to slow down and disrupt that dive since someone has to contest points instead of diving. Against immobile comps who want to utilize their range, Forcing point is used to bring them closer, decreasing their range, and making it easier for you to rush them down, especially with Sim TP. Mr. X had actually mentioned this on Suravasa, where Hardy can force points, Orisa drops, and then London can TP on the high ground, take a 5v4, and win the fight. By extension, that same idea used here about forcing points can also apply to the previous bunker examples on Ilios Ruins, Colosseo, Midtown, Gibraltar, and more. And depending on the map, you don't even have to use Sim TP. A good Maywall can do just fine. So future Kaja here. I mentioned this in the Ryan section, but for the love of God and all that's mighty, please do not W key if you get a bad wall. The amount of times it happened in the Overwatch League is actually crazy. If you don't get a good wall cycle, fine. But at least disengage. Don't keep walking forwards. Here's an example from the Shanghai Dragons. Viper doesn't get a good wall off, so that's an obvious mistake. But he needs to realize this and SK the fuck out of there so SBG don't get value off their cooldown cycle and their May wall. Instead, he plays way too aggressively, allowing SBG to get value off their cooldowns, leading to Viper dying. Surprisingly, I assume Fletcher realized that he needed to play passive after Viper got a terrible wall because he didn't pop his nemesis. If Viper had just backed off and Shanghai rotated to points, this neutral fight could easily be won by them. Now onto variations. I'll split this up into each individual role and then list their pros and cons in relation to the other options, which should help you decide which hero stylistically fit for you. For tank, the standard default has historically been Ryan, but there's two other main options, Ramatra and Sigma. Let's start with Ram. Credit to Spano for this advice back in late March last year. Ram's pros are his versatility compared to Reinhardt's. By virtue of having two different forms with different strengths, this is always going to be Ram's biggest bonus. Omnic form can be great for softening up the enemy Ryan before you actually go in and brawl. The second pro is really the pummels. They have more range than Ryan's wings, meaning it's easier to force the enemy May cooldowns from a safer distance, and they go through shields, and they technically have a higher DPS than Ryan's wings. The third pro is higher individual sustain. Block mitigating 75% of solo damage makes Ram's effective health upwards of 2000. The main con with Ramatra is that he has less team utility when compared to Reinhardt and Sigma. He can't block CC and he's got a harder time blocking specific instances of damage as Spyro says. Shatter is a big counter to Annihilation and Ramatra has a really hard time marking enemy DPS on high grounds. The second con, and arguably this could be a pro, but Ramatra is very cyclical. He needs pretty much all of his abilities to do anything and if you don't get value during your uptime, it's kind of Jova. Now onto Sigma. Sigma's main pro is obviously his range, the same logic applies to Amatra for that pro. But really, it's actually marking that Sigma is really really good at. 
If a Sojourn is on high ground with Relgon, or Ana Zen are lobbing utility into your team, Sigma has the range, with his hyperspheres and his shield, and his grasp even, to zone that off entirely. The third pro has to be the CC. It's why a reset into Sigma is such a hard matchup, because Accretion goes through Spearspin. Queen, Mauga, or Orisa get too close, Accretion is a guaranteed relief. The last pro is just how good Flux is. It's just so flexible, watch my Sigma guide for more on that. The main con to Sigma is of course the AoE, close range brawling capacity. Everyone knows that a good Winston Bubble or a Reinhardt swinging onto you, or even a smart Ramatra who can bait your rock can be really tough to deal with. And honestly, that's the main con of Sigma, but it's a pretty big one. Now onto Flex or Projectile DPS. This really just comes down to either Mei or Symmetra, because in almost every brawl comp, you'll at least see either of these heroes, if not both sometimes. I won't actually do a pros and cons list for either of them, because it really just comes down to what piece of utility, being the May wall or the Sim TP, that you need more. If you need to traverse big open spaces against comps that outmaneuver or outrange you, then Symmetra is probably a better fit than May. However, if the map is fairly linear, so it's easy to get good clean walls, and your TP is mainly limited to just TP bombing, then it's hard to go wrong with Mei. As a rule of thumb, you'll mostly see Symmetra used in non-mirrors, where you need to close the distance and rotate quite a lot to avoid staging or range threats. On Dorado, Gibraltar, Esperanza, Jungatown and Havana, Symmetra is a must pick if you're gonna force brawl. And whenever you can play both, the win condition becomes getting your Symmetra the full charge beam before the enemy hitscan can get value. And if Sojourn didn't exist, I think May Symmetra would be pretty strong. Now onto the main or hitscan DPS. Usually this is going to be the hero that's going to complement your Symmetra or May. The options are Sojourn, Cassidy, Hanzo, Bastion and Reaper. Let's start with the worst one, being Reaper. The only pro with the Reaper May is that maybe you have more chance to force out their May cryo first, and it's maybe a better option against bad Winston teams, I just really don't know, because without a Zarya bubble, your biggest con is that you just get forced out way too early and way too easily. I'll play an example from Flash Ops on the screen, so please, do not run Reaper May. Next up is Cassidy. Now I haven't seen May cast in a while, but the biggest pro with this is consistency. You're not relying on your Sojourn hitting that golden one shot, because each shot with Cassidy has the same value. Cassidy is also chonky. The HP buff, the damage reduction in roll and in high noon, paired alongside the nade, means that when Cassidy's on the angle, it's gonna be pretty hard to actually kill him. The biggest drawback however, has to be the lack of vertical mobility. All the other options have some form of vertical mobility to get to an angle that Cassidy just can't take. And unlike some of the other options, there is no one shot or big burst of damage for your team to play around. Not to mention, High Noon is kinda bad, that goes without saying, but I still think people underestimate the value of a good Cassidy angle. Next up is Hanzo. The biggest pro has to be the one shots. There's always that chance it's gonna happen, and you can see this very evidently in Atlanta Reign's matchup against the Spitfire during Pro-Am, where Lip just hits ridiculous shots and the fight is already over. The vertical mobility in War Climb is also much appreciated over Cassidy. Hanzo also has better flexibility, both in terms of his range, his greater burst damage, and his scouting potential with his Sonic Arrow. If you want to force rush on Dorado, Symmetra Hanzo isn't that bad of a DPS lineup. The biggest con with Hanzo is consistency. At least Sojourn has an SMG, Bastion has a DMR, and Cassidy has a revolver. With Hanzo, you're gambling on the one-shots, so you really need to be mechanically proficient on the hero. The second con with Hanzo is that he struggles against Dive, specifically Sombra Tracer. He has no CC or burst mobility to either fight off or absorb the dive entirely. And the last noticeable con is that Dragon Strike is pretty bad though arguably it's better than High Noon. But ultimately, I have Bastion. Obviously, the biggest pro is the tart form uptime. Bastion form, plus Ramatra form, and a good May wall, that's gonna be very hard to deal with. The sustain he gets in tart form as well actually allows him to walk up on frontline, unlike Reaper, which makes him a lot more threatening against Winston-based comps. Biggest cons are a bad ultimate, he's a bad duelist without his tart form due to his hitbox, meaning it's gonna be hard to get map control, and similar to Ramatra, you need to get value during a cycle. Good teams are just going to disengage after you pop turrets. And last but certainly not least, I have Sojourn. 
At least right now, Sojin is probably the best DPS in the game, along with Tracer. Sojin has a hit scan one shot, she also has vertical and horizontal burst mobility, and she's the only hit scan DPS with an actually good ultimate. There's just no reason to not play her. The only downside is that if your Sojin can't hit rails, you're gonna have a tough time. But Sojin is basically broken, so if the only downside is that you have to be good, I think Sojin's doing pretty well. Now onto main supports. Thankfully, 99% of the time, you're just gonna play Lucio, but in some very few and rare cases, you might wanna play Brig instead. This happened once in Flash Ops in EU, and it didn't go well, but I think that's mainly a skill issue, rather than a comp issue. In short, Brig plays more to absorb and sustain through a dive, playing to pocket squishies, whereas Lucio is a lot more flexible in terms of him also enabling his tank. It's why SRP check or running Ramatra, because he gets a natural speed boost when he brawls, whereas Ryan doesn't. Now onto flex support, and again, pretty simple. 99% of the time, you're gonna be playing Baptiste. But in a few cases, you're gonna see Moira. The biggest pro with Moira is mobility, especially with Coalescence, which can be hard for certain teams to deal with. She's also easier to fight off enemy dive DPS due to her fade and sustain. Biggest con is obviously the utility. No immortality is a big one, but if you're playing on a map or against a comp where Baptiste Lamp is just gonna prolong the death and not prevent it, Moira's not a terrible swap. You also lack a range in both your healing and your damage, which is also another notable downside of Moira sadly. Okay, finally, onto the matchups. Onto the traditional dive matchup. This usually features either Winston or Doomfist, sometimes Wrecking Ball, but you know, I think we've all seen that util video. The DPS are high mobility, usually a mixture of Tracer, Sombra, Genji, Echo or Sojin, and the backline is usually a Kiriko, Brig, Lucio, paired with Ana. The win condition of this comp into Brawl is simple. Leverage your added mobility to surround the Brawl comp as much as you can, then execute a dive onto a squishy target when they're ideally in open space. Afterwards, pull back, kite, and reset cooldowns, and then go for another dive engage. Comparatively, Brawl wants to disrupt that dive as much as possible. For keen viewers of mine, you'll already be familiar with the spa framework, and when applied here, the Brawl comp wants to prevent the dive from even happening, then absorb the dive with sustained cooldowns, and rotate aggressively during dive's downtime and when they're kiting back. And there's a few clever things that you can do to help each one of those stages. In the prevent stage, you can physically place heroes like Mei on the same flank to match the enemy Tracer, Genji or Echo, and win that duel, or at the very least, waste their time. London did this against Atlanta on Ilya as well, as Mr. X pointed out, but also against Vancouver Titans, with Sparker pretty commonly catching out and out dueling He Sang on Echo since he was by himself and on Antarctic Peninsula against Outlaws of Sombra Genji Kiriko, allowing them to win the first fights. They do it again here, where Admiral actually finds and jewels of Sombra, preventing the EMP dive, and straight up landing the kill on Happy. This is proactive play, and is something you need to consciously do. And again, I brought this up earlier, but that shock example on Gibraltar, where the Symmetra forces out and jewels of Sombra, and Backbone proactively warning, and LOSing off Renko. The second thing you can do in the prevent stage is just use Sims TP to skip rotations and to skip open space. I briefly brought this up when analysing the 2021 Grand Finals, but if Atlanta had just run Symmetra, they can skip all the staging that Shanghai have in place. London did this against Atlanta in playoffs on Blizzard World Attack, using the Sim TP to skip rotations and scuff up the staging of Atlanta's dive. Remember what Atlanta want to do, they want multiple angles onto squishies moving in open space, but if you just remove the open space parts, that win condition becomes a lot harder to fulfil. Using Sim TP to disrupt the enemy dive setup is really, really important against the big ult combos like EMP, Nanoblade, or Minefields. On Antarctic Peninsula, you can see London rotate with TP above to the high ground to try and catch the enemy Ana off guard. Unfortunately, because Hardy is just a bit behind and London still have to cross open space, they still lose the fight, but this idea of proactively taking charge and not just sitting in one place and getting dough from a big ult combo is so important. You have to play disruptive against the MP, you cannot just sit still. In the absorb stage, the most important thing you can do is to bunker and create dead zones. 
I've already covered this idea in depth in the macro section, but in short, the reason why you bunker against dive is to reduce the angles they take, and to make the angles that they do take more predictable and thus easier to absorb. The second thing you can do is force points, which again, already covered in the macro section, but forcing point against dive forces somebody from the enemy team to come and contest you, ensuring that they don't get that three angle setup. Here's an example from a rank game where Hardy forces point against the dive composition, again using SimTP to do so. This forces the dive to only have two angles of pressure as well as forcing the Winston to touch and commit bubble, making the threat of the dive a lot less significant. The enemy team end up blading, but unfortunately, it's just too little too late. So there, you can see both points about SimTP disrupting the dive setup and forcing points scuffing up the actual dive. Now onto the second matchup, Brawl Dive Hybrids. This is by far the broadest section, but this mainly encompasses the Orisa Genji, Junker Queen Genji, Zarya Genji or Reaper, Malga Genji or Reaper comps that are often paired with Lucio Bap, alongside some other hitscan, most commonly Sojin. This also includes the Winston or Doomfist 5-man composition, which is a Brawl Dive hybrid too, just a bit more on the divier side. Your win condition as the traditional Brawl comp is to straight up force a frontline fight. Keep the enemy tank, whether it's the Queen, Orisa, Mauga, Zarya, or Doomfist, as well as the enemy Reaper or Genji, at distance from your Baptiste. Utilize your shield to wither down the front line, survive the dive cycle, and then push back in. Their win condition is to somehow get their Genji or Reaper on top of your backline with a CD cycle. This can be Zarya bubbling Genji to go onto your Baptiste, or Queen shouting and then Genji engaging, or Orisa spear spinning in and brute forcing a dive onto your backline. With this in mind, how do we play to our win condition? Well, the first way is through open space. Make it hard for the enemy team, specifically the enemy tank, to reach and dance on top of your backline. In Flash Ops Grand Finals, we can see this on King's own first point, where there is a huge clot of open space for Hawk to cross, which makes it hard for him to get on top of Blue Team's backline. I mean, look at the damage he takes. He doesn't have a shield to walk up and close the distance. As a result, he gets his HP chunked, he gets walled off, and he dies. In Overwatch League, with London vs Shock on Mecha Base, you can see the amount of open space the Queen has to cross just to get on top of London's backline. Despite this, it's actually a smart TP by Backbone to set up a crossfire that ends up in Shock losing this fight. Since Shock's comp is still technically a brawl comp, I'll list four things Shock can do to help win this fight. Firstly, use an ultimate. Specifically, use an ultimate to make crossing the open space a lot more bearable. Sometimes this can be beat, for example, on Li Jiang Night Market, Boston beat rushed through open space on points, but it could easily be a Kitsune rush or a window. Secondly, force point with Genji Kiriko. This is something Shock later end up doing, and it forces London to either move or just give up the points. Thirdly, and this is a bit more map specific, but rotate the other side or just double back. Rotating the other side makes London's backline play closer, which is what Shock wants, so I don't know what Krusty was thinking going coast side. And lastly, split push. Send your Genji Kiriko, maybe Genji Lucio, underneath, and then send the rest of your team to go top. If London hold close, send your Genji through window and the rest through main. If the Baptiste is bad and plays in open space, it's basically a free kill. There you go. Four solutions on screen that don't require a Symmetra or a Mei to close the distance. For the last example, it's going to be against the Orisa comp on Li Jiang. Here, you can see how much space that Smurf and Decay have to cross just to get onto London's backline. Again, they try and window to make this rotation easier, but London just kites, window back, and Boston are stuck between a rock and a hard place, aka open space. London, however, make a misplay in a different fight. Boston still window first from a similar position, but because Hardy isn't in front of Sparker, whereas Smurf is spinning in front of Birdwing, London loses the HP trade and are forced to give up space, allowing Boston to cap points, close distance, and clamour on top of London. Instead, I would have liked to see a similar play that London do later, which I just showed, where London rotate away, window down main, making it super hard for Smurf to cross. Hardy contests point, and then you can even put your Mei Lucio to flank through White Room or help contest the points. Again, in this example here, you're always referring back to the key idea of forcing Boston to walk through open space just to get on top of your backline and then re-pushing when Boston's cycle of aggression is over. 
Again, from a rank perspective, you can see this from Hardy's most recent video on Malga vs Ryan. The clearest example was on Lee Jang Gardens, where the Malga had to walk through open space in 30 meters of distance just to get on top of Hardy. And because Malga has no shield or great team utility to rotate in these open spaces, the Malga and his team just get chunked before they can even touch points. Hardy was also baiting Malga's Kardec overdrive and playing super slow and from distance with his shield and then re-pushing once Malga doesn't have his overdrive since he doesn't get any lifesteal from just burning shield. On to the third matchup and this video is getting long so let's speed it up a little. Poke dive comps usually consist of a mobile supports, a mobile tank and a mixture of both at DPS. At tank you'll normally have Doomfist or Ball, any choosing of Tracer, Ash, Hanzo, Sojourn, Genji, Echo, Sombra, and frankly half the DPS cast, and usually Ana Zen. Their basic win condition is to soften you up early and from range with soft dives from the Doomfist and the Ball until they've softened you up enough to where they then hard dive a squishy of yours. Your win condition is actually pretty varied. The spa framework still applies here, meaning if you're able to prevent the Doomfist from even engaging with basic poke damage, absorb it through bunkering, sustain cooldowns, and isolating their Doomfist entirely, and then rotating aggressively when he's on his downtime, you're off to a good start. But there's actually another win condition, we're just trying to rotate and run it down on the enemy backline because of how much of a threat they are at range. Spyro made a great video covering this matchup, and again this video is getting long so I'll link it below. Now onto the second to last matchup of just poke comps. And poke comps are just exactly that. Sigma plus the range snipers plus BAP Zen, but some teams will swap the BAP out for the Ana on occasion. Their win condition is straightforward, whittle down your composition so much that by the time you're on top of them, it's already too late. Your win condition is also straightforward. Isolate the Sigma with most likely clean walls, rotate between enclosed spaces with Symmetra TP, and force corner to corner situations where the enemy team have to walk forward and contest points. On Circuit Real first point defense for example, Mei is really broken here, as the Sigma and frankly the entire enemy comp are forced into a corner to corner situation, giving you this nice short sightline in open space, meaning it's easy to just W key and get a good wall. Lost matchup, thank gods. Poke Brawl comps are actually hybrids that you commonly see in your average quick play or rank games, but usually in pro play, the most recent Poke Brawl hybrid was the Sigma, Bap, Iliari, Soldier, and Symmetra comp. Their win condition is that the three man and a two man group splits with the Soldier and Iliari taking a different angle to the Sigma, Bap, and Symmetra, pressuring the Brawl comp from range and forcing them to rush you. And then when they do rush you, you pull back, live through the rush, and then re push once their rush is over. Our win condition is varied. Look to overload with man advantage one of the two sides before the other side gets value, or on defense, just stalemate and match the Sojourn Alari with your Mei Lucio. This will burn the clock and force the Sojourn Aliari to play closer, which is perfect for a rush. Again, the GOAT Commander X made a 22 minute video going over this matchup, and Capitology also made a video going over this matchup, and this is just time that I don't have, but I still want to show at least an example of my own. For example, on Route 66, we can see Finland choose to overload the side of the Sigma, Baptiste and Symmetra. Because of the map geometry and how wide Sojourn Alari have to flank, and because of how enclosed and short sightline third point generally is, Lubda gets marked by Cloud and dies before the Sojourn Iliari are in position. Still, Quartz does Quartz things and gets a pick, and Keisei does live and repush, but Vestola's Flux shuts down that fight for Finland. And that's it for the video. For further resources and videos, there'll be a ton of links down below, but hopefully I was concise and accurate enough in this guide. There's a lot of ground to cover. If you made it this far, please share this around as well. It took over 15 hours to make, and it's probably the best brawl guide out there right now. And as always, let me know your thoughts down below, and until next time.